God is good. And all the time, amen. Before we get into the fall quarter next week, I've been sharing a very brief series of messages on angels, holy angels and fallen angels. I shared with you weeks ago the importance of angels in the life of Jesus, how they were involved in his ministry. We took a look at Satan and his angels and how you can be victorious in spiritual warfare. So today I want to bring you one final message on the invisible world. I hope you know that there is a a spirit realm out there. And there are two kingdoms in this invisible world. One is the kingdom of light and God is the owner of that kingdom. The other is the kingdom of darkness And Satan, who is the prince of the power of the air, he tries to exert his authority on us. And of course, these two kingdoms are in conflict with one another. Today, we live in an age of occultism. The occult is as popular today as it's ever been. People claim to be spiritual, but they don't want anything to do with Jesus. But see, when you bypass God, it's easy to tap into the wrong kind of spirit. Amen. So many things out there like witchcraft and sorcery and seances and fortune tellers and palm readers and tarot card readers and channelers who receive knowledge from the dark world. And there's all kinds of information on the occult and Satanism available at your fingertips online. But the problem is, if you dabble in any of those kinds of things, you open yourself up to demonic activity in your life. And parents, let me say this. You even have to be careful of certain video games that your kids play. Some of those games can be harmful to your children. Now, I know that there are many innocent video games, but in some of them, the level of violence just keeps increasing every time they come out with a new version of the game. And it only fuels aggression, anger, and violence in children. Research shows that many of those young people who were involved in school shootings have a history of playing violent video games. In those violent games, you've got the power to kill anybody. Somebody gets in your way, you just kill them. Unfortunately, some of those acted out in real life. And some children will stay up playing those games all night long if you let them. So parents, you might want to play some of the games that your children play so you can see what they're getting into. Now, today I want to talk to you about another level of occultic activity. This has to do with miracles. And that leads us to one of the most interesting passages in Scripture. And I shared this incident with you a couple of weeks ago from Acts chapter 19, but I want to take you back to it today where the Apostle Paul was ministering there in Ephesus, which was a hotbed of satanic activity. And the first thing I want to point out from Acts chapter 9 is we see the power of Christ here. The power of Christ. Some apostles, like Paul, were given just amazing spiritual gifts and abilities. Look at verses 11 and 12 of Acts 19. It says, God was doing extraordinary miracles, not just miracles by the hands of Paul, but extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul. So much so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. These were extraordinary miracles, even for an apostle. Now, you probably know that Paul supported himself by making tents. He was a tent maker. So I would imagine that as he worked, he wore an apron and then he would use a handkerchief to wipe the sweat from his brow. But the power of God so filled his life that when these items were taken to other people, that they were healed of diseases and evil spirits would come out of them. Of course, it really wasn't Paul. It was actually the power of the Holy Spirit doing these miracles through Paul. As you read the Bible, you notice that there are three eras where you see the greatest miracles. First of all was the time of Moses. During the time of Moses, when God performed mighty miracles, 
to free his people from slavery in Egypt. The second period was during the time of Elijah and Elisha, right before that prophetic office began. And then the third era was during the time of Jesus and his apostles. Well, you see, Paul wasn't like these TV and radio preachers that are around today. He said, yeah, send me some, some seed money and I'll send you an anointed handkerchief. That's total abuse of this passage. Do you ever hear that kind of claim? Hold on to your money tight. They may claim the name of Jesus, but they're charlatans. Amen. Yes, God still cast out demons today. Yes, God still heals the sick today. But you got to remember, there are many false prophets out there in the world today. Can somebody say amen to that? Now let's look at the power of the devil. The power of the devil. And I want you to notice the dark side in this passage and the, the great clash that takes place here. We pick up in verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Wow. I know some of you told me you never heard this story before, so I thought it bared repeating today, and we'd see what else we could glean from this. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of demonic power to be able to inflict that kind of violence on seven different brothers. We don't know much about these seven sons of Sceva, but obviously there were itinerant Jewish exorcists who traveled around the country trying to cast out demons. They probably saw Paul doing extraordinary miracles in the name of Jesus, and they thought, wow, we can cast out demons like Paul can. And so they said to this demon-possessed man, I command you by the Jesus that Paul proclaims. <laughs> but it didn't work. And the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know, but who are you? You see, evil spirits, they would immediately flee from the power of Jesus and even flee from the power of Paul. But it was if this evil spirit was saying, listen, I have to obey the spirit of God, but who are you? I have to obey the power from Paul of the Holy Spirit, but who are you? You don't have any authority over me. Who in the world are you to name the name of Jesus? You don't even know Jesus. And the man who had the evil spirit, it says, quickly leaped on all of them, violently beat them up and stripped them of all their clothes. They were so terrified that they ran away as fast as they could, naked and bruised and bloodied. Can you imagine seven naked men running through town trying to explain what just happened? Well, maybe you don't need to imagine that. But they learn that the name of Jesus is not just a good luck charm. Amen. Listen, there are all kinds of ministries out there today. And many of them are good ministries. But I'm here to tell you that there are also many false prophets out there and they're invoking the name of Jesus. Amen. You know how to tell a false prophet? Jesus said the tree is known by the fruit it bears. Amen. I'll tell you, one of the ways you can usually spot a false prophet is, first of all, they're usually arrogant, very arrogant. They've made all their millions and they declare that you're going to be rich. God wants you to be rich. God wants all of his people to be rich. You ever heard some of them say that? Yeah, that's called the prosperity gospel. God wants all of his people to be rich. What about Jesus? What does that have to say about Jesus? He wasn't rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, look at what it says. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became what? Poor. The Son of God is eternal. I mean, he had everything before he came to earth in the person of Jesus. He was rich beyond comparison. He owned it all. The earth is the Lord. 
and the fullness thereof. Psalm 24, 1. But he gave it all up for us. We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, he gave it all up. Yet for your sake, he became poor. So that by his poverty, you might become rich. But they say God wants all his people to be rich. Tell that to the apostles who hardly had anything. Jesus didn't even own a home. When somebody asked him where he lived, he said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his, to lay his head. Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He wasn't even a homeowner. Yet all the false prophets claim, send me some of that fe- seed faith money. Just send it here. And I declare you're going to be rich. Please give me a break. And then the the thing is, if you don't get your miracle, well, that's your fault. You didn't have enough faith. Amen. That's what they say. Another thing you can tell about false prophets is that they're always speaking positive messages. Nothing wrong with positive messages. We need to hear them from time to time. But they tell people exactly what they want to hear. People love to hear prosperity. But they don't want to hear you preach about greed. And the problem that the love of money is. They don't want to hear that. All they want to hear is health and wealth. But if you notice these false prophets, they don't ever preach about sin and repentance. That's not what people want to hear. You know, the Apostle Paul prophesied about these days we're living in. Look at what he told Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. This is where we live today. For the time is coming, and it's here, when people will not endure sound teaching. I praise God for the people of Zion who endure sound teaching. But this is what he says. Most people having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. If that's not 2022, I don't know what is. Amen. Beware of false prophets. That's what Jesus said. They get big crowds because they tickle your ears. They tell you what you want to hear. Now, listen, not every mega church is bad. There are some good ones out there. But Jesus said that in the last days, there would be many false prophets to arise and lead many people astray. And we're already seeing that. So in this account of the seven sons of Sceva, you learn, first of all, that the name of Jesus is not a good luck charm. Because if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you cannot do anything in the power of Jesus name. Amen. So many false religions out there today using the name of Jesus. They come knocking on your door. Mormons. Seventh-day Adventists. Jehovah's Witnesses. They all use the name of Jesus. But if you talk to them, you find out they don't believe in the Jesus as revealed in the scriptures. Amen. If you talk to them, you better know your Bible. Because they're trained in what they believe. You better know how to refute them. If you don't know what they believe, just go online. And you can find out what they really believe. They say they believe the same as you, but the Jesus they believe is not the Jesus we believe. Somebody say amen to that. One other thing I want to point out is the power of repentance that we see in this passage. I want you to notice the repentance that this whole incident In Ephesus brought about. We pick up in verse 17. And this became known. This incident with the seven sons of Sceva became known to everybody. It says all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And fear fell upon them all. All means all. And that's all all means. Fear fell upon everybody. Fell on them all. And the name of Jesus was extolled or praised. 
And many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found that it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This was big news in town. Major news. Everybody in Ephesus, it says they heard about it, Jews and Greeks. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, when you got seven guys running around naked and bloody trying to find the nearest clothing store, people are going to hear about it. Word about this event spread quickly, and they didn't even have social media back then. But it brought about true repentance and revival in the city of Ephesus. We need that kind of repentance and revival in Dickinson County today. Can I get an amen to that? The fear of God, it said, fell on everybody. And the name of the Lord Jesus was praised. His name was honored. His name was praised because the fear of God fell on all the Ephesians. They got it. They realized, they understood that you don't play around with the occult. Because demons have power. And they are real. It says many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. As I told you at the outset, Ephesus was a hotbed of satanic activity and cultism. And now those who are believers, they're bringing their magic books. They're divulging their their practices. They're, they're, They're confessing their sin. And they burned their magic arts books. That was true repentance. Amen. Amen. This brought about revival in the city. They understood that the power of God was greater than the power of darkness. And they confessed their sin and they burned all their magic books in the sight of everybody. They stepped out of the darkness and stepped into the light. They made a clean break with all of their secret sorceries. Anybody who practiced witchcraft and sorcery just came out of the woodwork with all their books of spells and magic incantations. And they made a a huge bonfire in town right there in front of everybody. Years ago, many years ago, when I stop and think about it, I worked at a health food store in Greenville, Tennessee. And I learned a lot about using natural herbs for healing. And I'd purchased a number of books that explained the medicinal power of herbs. But one of the books that I owned, it puzzled me because it actually had some spells and incantations in the back of the book. But when I got saved, I got rid of that book because I knew that it wasn't God honoring to have a book like that in my apartment. I didn't want anything like that hindering the power of God from being at work in my life. I can understand how those Ephesians were. They just wanted to get rid of that stuff and burn it all. See, that's what happens when you really repent of your sins. Amen. You make a a clean break from your sinful past. And whatever you do that's not God honoring or, or whatever you say that's not God honoring, you know it needs to go. Can somebody say amen to that? That's repentance. This city was a hub of the occult and sorcery and idolatry and demonism. But when these people realized the power of God, they burned their magic books in front of everybody. And it says all those books were worth the equivalent of 50,000 pieces of silver. I did a little research on that since the last time I brought this story up. And I found out that one piece of silver at that time was the equivalent of one day's pay. So 50,000 pieces of silver would amount to about a year's wage for 250 people. That's a lot of money. All that money going up in smoke. But the wonderful thing about their repentance is it was complete. See, when you, when you burn something, that's final. You can't get it back out of the ashes. Amen. You can't say, well, I think I'm going to go back the next day and get it back. No. 
Burning their magic books in front of everybody was a wonderful idea because it indicated a complete and true repentance. And not only was their repentance complete, but it was costly. It cost them a lot of money. They chose to follow Jesus and destroy anything in their lives that was ungodly, no matter what it cost them. So they took these things and burned them up in the fire. That's repentance, y'all. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Like the song says, I've decided to follow Jesus. What's the rest of it? No turning back. No turning back. Amen? Are you following Jesus like that? When you truly decide to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you something. Amen? When you really decide to follow Jesus, there is no turning back. So I got to ask you today, is there anything in your life that's holding you back from complete repentance? Are you willing to let go of anything that is not God honoring? Even if it costs you something. I mean, think about it. Jesus humbled himself and he gave up everything for you. Everything. I showed you this scripture earlier, though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor so that through his poverty, you might become rich. Jesus gave up everything to save you. It cost Jesus his life on the cross. He did that for you. So what is it that you need to give up for Jesus today? What is it that you need to give up for Jesus today? No matter what it costs you. Are you willing to pay that price? Jesus, who was supremely blessed beyond measure, he became a curse for us. Look at Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. If Jesus could do that for you, what are you going to do for him? Have you really repented of your former life and your sins? Are you willing to give up anything that's not God honoring? Jesus, who lived a perfect life, a sinless life, fulfilled the law and became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, for our sake... God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus bore your sin on a tree. He was sinless, but he took on sin. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the gospel, my friends. That's the truth. And that is good news indeed. Can somebody say amen to that? Listen, somebody once said that if you're going to jump over a chasm, it's better to do it in one long jump than in two short ones. So when you get saved, you need to do it right. Amen. Amen. That's true repentance. No turning back. No turning back. You might be sitting there thinking, well, it's too costly. what Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to count the cost. It might cost you something to follow Jesus, but does it really matter how much it costs? Your eternity, your soul, your spiritual health is at stake here. Those Ephesians, they were willing to give up everything and burn up all their ungodly magic books, no matter what it cost them. That indicated their true faith in God. Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, anybody who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. No turning back. No turning back. So as we wrap up this series on the spiritual realm, I want you to know that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. He's Lord of all. He is triumphant over all the forces of evil. Jesus paid it all. He won it all and he deserves it all. Amen. Amen. We give him all the glory and we give him all the praise. 
And one day Jesus will cast Satan and all of his evil angels into the lake of fire. But he's already won the victory through his death, burial, and resurrection. There's no contest. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. Amen? When you read the book of Revelation, you know what happens to Satan. You know where he's heading, right? Mm -hmm. He knows it too, but he doesn't want you to know that he's a defeated foe. That's why you can just resist him and he'll flee. He's defeated. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He's already defeated. And if Satan is accusing you today, filling your mind with guilt, telling you that God won't forgive your sin, you just take him to the word. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Amen. You know where he's going. Jesus Christ is the victor. Somebody say amen. Amen. He is the total victor and he came to destroy the works of the devil. There may be somebody here today or maybe they're watching online and you've never received Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. I want you to know that Jesus came to earth, humbled himself, took on flesh and blood. He died in your place so that you could be redeemed. If God is speaking to your heart today, believe on his son. Receive him today as your Lord and Savior. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. They say if you want to get rid of flies, you got to get rid of the garbage. Amen? Amen. Let it go or else you're going to remain in the realm of the dark side of the spirit world. God is inviting you today to a new life. A life of freedom. A life of total deliverance. If you will just believe that Jesus is the only answer to your problems. Jesus is the solution. Amen. Amen. He is the son of the living God. Amen. Amen. He is Lord over all. He's Lord over the devil and all of his angels. We serve a risen savior. Amen. Amen. Triumphant. Jesus, who is Lord of all. Listen, if you're already a believer, I want you to know that whenever you hear the word of God preach, you need to respond to it. Either God's telling you something to do or something you need to believe, but you always respond to the word of God. Maybe, maybe there's something you heard today that you need to believe or, or maybe there's a sin you need to repent of or, or maybe you heard something that God wants you to do. All I know is this. God said his word never returns to him void. Amen. It always accomplishes what he sent it to do and he will always prosper it wherever he sends it. So may the Holy Spirit apply the word of God to your life and your heart today. Let the church say amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are indeed privileged to know you as our God, as our Father, as our Redeemer, as the giver and sustainer of life. Thank you that you have given us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. I'm so glad that you are love and because you are love, you chose to redeem us. We realize that you didn't have to. You could have condemned all of us as sinners. But because you love us, you sent your son into the world to be our savior. And Jesus, you came into this world out of love for us. Because you desired that we be saved. You said greater love is no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what you did for us. So we thank you, Jesus, for your death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, and every time we share a message, you, you speak to every heart differently. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just apply this message to every life whether it's something to believe or something to do or maybe some sin to repent of, we want to be sold out followers of Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And Father, for those who have never bowed the knee and surrendered their life to Jesus, I pray that the word would just sink down deep into their hearts so that they would not reject the word today. Don't let the enemy snatch it out of their hearts, but may today be the day of salvation 
May they just surrender to you and yield their lives to you. You said whoever comes to you, you will never cast away. You will not cast them out. So, Lord, just do your thing today. Have your way in the hearts of everyone who hears these words. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen.